big, big thanks to our great speaker tonight, Dr. John Kumani. He will introduce himself. He's from IQC, Institute for Quantum Computing, here at the University of Waterloo, perhaps the most renowned institute in the world about quantum computing. It's all uh, dedicated to quantum technologies and quantum <laughs> computation, communication. Uh, thank you. Yeah, all right. Okay, how's everyone doing tonight? Did everyone get their pizza? Everyone's good on that? For the record, you keep eating it. It's gotta eat it, so like, go at it, attack, by all means. We got vegetarian, we got vegan, there's soda, there's some yo-yos if you didn't get a yo-yo. Uh, so yeah, take what you need. Um, yeah, so my name's John Donahue. I'm the outreach manager at the Institute for Quantum Computing. Uh, so what that means is I do a lot of outreach. I go out to schools uh, and talk with undergrad classes and you know, kind of talk about what quantum is. Before that, I uh, studied quantum optics at the Institute for Quantum Computing. Uh, so that was my specialty. My specialty was along lines of photonics. And then I uh, worked in Germany during research for a couple years. So yeah, I'm the outreach manager. My job is to talk about quantum. People who don't necessarily know anything about quantum. But I'm at the Kitchener Waterloo Quantum Enthusiast Meetup. So the main purpose of my talk is not to explain quantum. So just to get a read of the room, how many people are kind of coming in cold, not knowing what quantum computing really is? Yeah? Okay, we got a couple. Okay, so I'm gonna do the quick five minute, this is what quantum computing is feel. So quantum computing, <laughs> first off, what is quantum? So when we stop talking about quantum physics, what we're talking about is physics where you can no longer start splitting things in two. So kind of the nice example of that is a photon. So I think about light, I have this nice bright light, but I can think about a continuous dial that I turn. And I'm making my light go from, uh, you know, like a dimmer switch, it's going from 30 watt brightness to 60 watt brightness. When I start talking about quantum light, that's no longer the case. I have to start counting it case by case. I can have zero photons of light, or I can have one photon of light, or I can have two photons of light. I can't have one and a half photons of light. I can't just split that in two. And this, you know, photons are one way to think about it, but this also comes up with things like the energies of electrons. So if I have an electron, it might have, you know, two electron volts of energy or three electron volts of energy. Those might be allowed, but two and a half electron volts of energy is not allowed. There's these very fine levels that can go on. Now, so that's, yeah, one way to think about it is just we're taking physics as we normally understand it and making it into these discrete levels. Now, so, other interesting things that happen there is that we can have something where we have, say, on average, one and a half photons. And we can start thinking about those as what we call superpositions. So I can have something where it is both this low energy state and this high energy state uh, in superposition. So think about it like waves, they come together, but you can like have two different kinds of waves happening at the same time. Same idea, but in this kind of discrete space. So if I think about this as uh, this energy and this energy, the superposition of this and this at the same time. Rough wording. Um, yeah, but when I measure it, I only get one or the other. So if I ever look at my electron and I ask it what is its energy, even though on average it's two and a half electron volts, whenever I measure it, I will measure either two or three. Yeah. So this kind of, you know, I'm talking about things that come in pairs. I can also think about this exactly like I think about bits in computers. So bits in computers work the same way, they're discrete. They're either zero or one. It doesn't make sense to ask is what if a bit is one half. Uh, so when I think about these energy states and these electrons, for example, I can think about them as my bits. If it's a low energy, I'm gonna say that's zero. If it's a high energy, I'm gonna say that's one. But now instead of just being restricted to being zero and one, I can have these superpositions of zero and one. And this superposition can be over many different electrons. I can have two electrons where they're either both in the zero state or both in the one state. So you know, superpositions that no longer are just about one electron at a time, but over many, over large groups of electrons at one time. Yeah? So far so good? Yeah? Okay, and yeah, that's effectively what we do with quantum computing. We take these quantum systems that we can make either zero or one and also in superposition, we find different ways that we can make the zeros and ones propagate through some circuit, the same way that regular computing works, but now we have properties like superposition and entanglement, and we see what other kinds of algorithms we can implement. So yeah, because we're dealing with different rules, 
the same kind of rules that govern regular classical computing don't necessarily work the exact same way. And we find that in certain cases, not all of them intuitive, and definitely we haven't discovered all of them yet, we get these large computational speedups. That's what quantum computing is. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, I come from the Institute for Quantum Computing. And um, yeah, so uh, what we are, we are at the University of Waterloo. We're not a faculty, but we're an institute within the University of Waterloo. Uh, we have about 31 professors now from seven departments and over 200 researchers total when you include postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, and undergraduate researchers. Uh, we were founded in 2002. We have a large cleaner facility for device fabrication, uh, as well as lab space for experimental physics along with uh, whiteboard space for the theorists. And we're the birthplace of about, I think the count now is 13 startups that have come out of research being done at the ITC. We're spread over two buildings, the Quantum Nano Center on, camp on the main campus and the Research Advancement Center just to the north of main campus. That's also the home of the Quantum Ideas Lab and the Transformative Quantum Technologies Initiative. So yeah, this is, that, that's where we are. Uh, but yeah, so we were founded in 2002. So what was the world like in 2002? Can everyone remember 2002? Yeah? Yeah? Can you put yourself there? What, what do you think you were doing in 2002? Not this. Using a Nokia phone. Using a, yeah, Nokia phone, yeah, yeah. The world was a lot different in 2002, and a lot has changed since 2002. The computers were dead. Sorry? The laptop, it was like Windows 98 or Windows XP. Yeah, that's, yeah, that was, yeah, that's pre-XP, that's pre-XP. We were, we're living in a different the world. The phones were, like, they didn't have smartphones, they were just, ah. like, regular. Was Blackberry a thing in 2002? Was it even an idea? Oh, it was, that, that, that I'm actually not sure yeah, about. Was. Blackberry was three years old. It was three years old? Yeah, so it was, it was a young, it was a baby. <laughs> oh, brighter times. Uh, but yeah. So 2002 was a long time ago. So what I have here is the kind of the timeline as it pertains to quantum computing, starting with 1980 over here, ending with 2019 over here. So in 1981, that was really when people first uttered the word quantum computing. It's often, it's often attributed to Richard Feynman, uh, uh, but really the one who formalized a lot of it at the very start in 1981 was Paul Benioff. Uh, and similarly, in 1981, that was the first time that the non-locality of entanglement was uh, proven for the first time. So that two particles can be entangled and it's not, uh, it's, something, it's an effect that can go across large distances. So that was 1981, and in 1984, quantum key distribution is proposed. That's a way to communicate using quantum physics in a perfectly secure way. We'll come back to that one later. Uh, and then the real boom started happening around the 1994 era. So 1992, the Deutsch, the Deutsch Jose algorithm was proposed. This was the first quantum algorithm that was proposed for something other than quantum. So this wasn't, uh, you know, just designing quantum systems for the sake of designing quantum systems or to learn about quantum systems. This was something that could solve a problem that didn't seem quantum, but do it in a way that was much faster than classical computers can. So in this case, the problem was completely useless. The problem was something like, it was uh, something called a function discrimination problem. If I have two functions, or two different kinds of functions, can you tell me which kind of function I have? Uh, the upshot of it was for a classical computer, it would take a linear number of steps, and a quantum computer can do it in one shot. Yeah, so this was the first one that got people going like, okay, this is interesting. People looked at it a while longer, and then in 1994, kind of the silver bullet came along, that was Shor's factoring algorithm which had an exponential speed up over the classical algorithm in terms of like finding the prime factors of a number. In 1996, David DiVincenzo uh, listed and you know, kind of clarified the criteria for a quantum computer to actually work. And these were five criteria that were said, okay, once we have these five things down, we can use a quantum computer for useful things. Still haven't exactly met those five. <laughs> we're working on it real hard. Uh, and also around this time, the experiments started catching up as well. So we were able to implement these, what we call quantum gates uh, in physical systems. So this was, for example, like implementing a controlled not gate. So that'd be a gate where, you know, if both are zero, do nothing. If this one is one, if, uh, sorry, if this bit is the value one, then flip this bit. If this bit is the value zero, do not flip this bit. 
So you need the bits to talk to each other in that sense. So ways to do that using trapped ion systems or in a nuclear magnetic resonance-based systems, or using linear optics alone were proposed in between 1995 and 2000, and different uh, formalisms for quantum computing, such as topological quantum computing and cluster state quantum computing, started around this time. In 2002, right here, that's when the IPC came up. So now this is so I'm going to divide this roughly into selfishly, completely selfishly, into pre-IQC and post-IQC. Because, okay, let's see what happened after that. So this is kind of the first quantum computing hype scale was right around here. This is where we were able to get money to actually build an institute in Waterloo. A couple more institutes follow in the coming years, such as the Joint One Institute in Maryland and the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore. Uh, and there have been some milestones that have been accomplished since then, some like, really distinct milestones. So, uh, for example, superconducting circuits, which is where you're writing it into like small circuits of superconducting material, very compatible with the kind of circuitry that we can draw in a normal fabrication facility. Doing those kind of things happened around the mid-2000s, figuring out how we can control these, boom, there. Uh, and there have been some uh, advances that have been really noteworthy in terms of uh, proving entanglements exist, proving the factuality of entanglements, such as the first loophole-free entanglement verification, which was only a couple years ago. But kind of the bigger things that seem to show up in the news are things like, for example, 2011, D-Wave sells the first commercial quantum computer. And people are still arguing to this day about what exactly it is. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's one thing that you know, got the news. And then you look at things like, okay, who else is getting into the game? Yeah, there, are other, there have been other university quantum institutes that have shown up, you know, ones that are directly affiliated with universities, have professors as faculty, you know, it's publicly funded. But then also, starting with Microsoft Station Q in, I believe, 2005, and more recently with Google and IBM's quantum initiatives, as well as Intel's, I'm leaving a whole bunch off of that list of like big, big computing companies, they also have opened up their own quantum forces and have entered the so-called arms race for the quantum computer. Uh, and then recently, just the last couple of years, so Google announced its first 72 qubit quantum computer that they're not still having, as far as I know, they haven't let anyone look at it yet, but they say they have. Uh, so that was last year, and then this year, IBM announced its commercial 20 qubit quantum computer that you can buy if you have big nest egg underneath your pillows. How much? Huh. I should have looked up that number. Uh, does anyone know the number of him? He pays one, sir. He pays one. Yeah, it's tens of millions for sure. Yeah. And it takes up space. Like this D way one, you can see the guy standing in front of it. That's giving you a good idea of the scale. You have the one, it's a felt insane. It's okay. Which, you know, the same way that, you know, the computers in the 1960s were. Uh, and then also, in the last couple years, so the European Union quantum flagship was announced in 2017. That was $1 billion across the European Union to fund quantum science. And uh, just last year, the US and China announced national quantum initiatives in the billion dollar range. So okay, so what's been the big difference? What's changed since 2002? So number one, we got a massive increase in private interest, both large, your Googles and your Microsofts, as well as small quantum startups have been booming as well. And there's been billion dollar multinational government initiatives. And a lot of these multinational initiatives, you, know, you can only get the money if it's a university working with a private company. So I mean, this is good. People are interested. People are hyped about it. So you know, you might think, okay, we've got a quantum summer coming up. Everyone's really, in everyone's really invested. Everyone's really into it. But if you're a pessimist, you might look at this and say the opposite approach, especially when you know that there's been maybe a reduction in obvious milestones, and there's a bit of a reduction in low-hanging low fruit for you know, universities or research groups to really get. Kind of the big question that always comes up is, when are we going to get a scalable 100 qubit quantum computer? And it's really hard to come up with something, another milestone to show to people that will get them as excited as that. Whereas you know, 15 years ago, there are plenty of milestones. You can say, look at all this accomplishment. Made. Stuff is still happening, but it's hard to say, uh, look at this one specific thing that shows how far things are going. So, and then, yeah, if I also look at this massive increase in private interest, does that leave room for universities anymore? And these billion dollar multinational investments, what happens if in five years we still don't have that 100 qubit quantum computer? Does that mean all the funding just goes away after that? 
So that's got some people worried about less about a quantum summer and a bit more about a quantum winter. It's a legitimate worry. I don't think it's going to happen. It's a legitimate worry. So in all this, to, and especially when we're talking about avoiding this quantum winter, what's the role of the university? So what role can a university institute, a public institute, like for example the Institute for Quantum Computing, or just the University of Waterloo, universities around the world, what role do they play? So I want to highlight two specific things. The first one, diversification. Okay, what do I what do I mean by that? So one of the roles of the university is connecting these distinct backgrounds. So a university does not exist as you know, a physics institute or you know, a computer science institute. And quantum computing, as you can tell by its name, it's got quantum, which you know, rings of physics and computing, which computer science, is a very multidisciplinary field. So at the IEC in particular, we have people from these, these seven different departments, and we need them all to talk to each other. And the university is kind of a natural place for that to happen, to get these people of different backgrounds together, get them talking, and you know, the computer scientists might have some idea uh, about what they can maybe do, but with a quantum computer, but can it actually be done in practice? Things like that, you need to bring people together to actually answer these questions. But then, okay, even if we focus on just a few of those, so we'll look at just chemistry, engineering, and physics, completely unfair. Uh, we still have to, you still have diversification beyond that. So you might have the ask to pick your qubit. So your qubit has to be something that has two states that you can control, two states that can exist in superposition with each other, that that superposition remains what we call coherent for a long time, and that we can make two different qubits talk to each other. And there are kind of four main systems that you can think about. Uh, one would be atoms and ions, so you take a charged particle, you trap it using electrodynamics, uh, like using what's called the linear Paul trap, you uh, peek around and you kind of put it in one spot. It's actually moving around a little bit, but effectively you put it in one spot. And then you're able to control its energy state. So that's really thinking about that energy of that electron. You can think about photons, where you have one single photon, and you maybe put it in a superposition of being both here and here. Or you put it in a superposition of being this polarized versus this polarized. You can think about spin of electrons, for example. So that would be kind of a solid state material, or in NMR, the spins of different atoms in one molecule. And you can think about superconducting circuits. So that's uh, vaguely like whether or not a circuit is flowing, uh, a current is flowing around the loop clockwise or counterclockwise, if you put that in a magnetic field, those will have an energy splitting as well that you can address and you can put into superposition. And yeah, basically basically speaking, anyone who knows anything deep about one of these four doesn't know how to handle the other three. You know, you, you read some news, you try to keep up to date, but you know, I know photons very well. Uh, and if you ask me to build an ion trap, I would uh, so when you hire a team of people, if I'm a business and I want to pursue, pursue one, I really have to pick one of my horses and go for it. And that is what you end up seeing. So these are a bunch of the, the companies who are in the quantum computing race right now, what only they pick. Some of them I, some of them have diversified a little bit and put into two different boxes. But you know, everyone is trying all of them. So all together they are represented, but they're represented by different companies. Meanwhile, just looking at the experimental physicists at, an, at a university institute such as the IQC, we have all of these four different uh, <coughs> qubits, all these four different frameworks represented. And the, all the people working on those different frameworks are able to talk back and forth to each other. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one big thing, is that we can kind of pursue all these different ones, but we're not looking to build the thousand qubit form. That does become a large engineering task and then you do need a large, a very, very large team to do it. But if we're just looking to figure out the kinks, you know, where things are going wrong, then yeah, we can have small teams of scientists working on these problems with deep expertise in a very specific subject matter. Yeah? Uh, and I'm gonna let you know on the dirty secret. Uh, at any quantum institute, that you see included, a solid percentage of professors do not care about quantum computing. Just that. <laughs> uh, quantum computing, yeah, that was a bit strong. They care about quantum computing, but they don't think about it as uh, researching quantum computing. We think about it as researching you know, 
whether it be quantum physics, whether or not it be the mathematics behind quantum physics, you know, different algebras that underlie quantum physics, that's where the, a lot of, for a lot of them the interest really lies, as opposed to you know, computational speedups. Don't get me wrong, our computer scientists love their computational speedups, and Greek engineers who are really into building the thing, but in that middle range you get a lot of people who are just interested in you know, how does this system work. The important thing there is that when, when you're trying to build a quantum computer, that's not the only thing that happens in that process. Other things do come out of that technology that, you know, A, are interesting, and B, are, have potential uses in the world. So one example which I touched upon briefly is quantum cryptography. So this is a quantum technique you can use to generate uh, a perfectly secure key, so a perfectly secure string of random characters between two different people. So by a key, I mean, you know, if I want to encode a message and send it to you, uh, I don't want to send that message to you right away, because if someone in the middle reads it, they'll be able to know exactly what I'm saying, say it's sensitive information. So what we want to do is we want to be able to share some big random string of numbers, and then just mix my data with that string of numbers in a way that when you get the message, you can unmix it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah, the problem is, of course, how do you exchange that big string of random numbers to begin with? And what quantum physics allows you to do is exchange that big string of random numbers in such a way that if someone in the middle tries to read it, you'll be able to know. You can think about it like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. When you measure a quantum state, you disturb the quantum state. So if I'm sending a message, I'm sending a quantum state out to someone else across the room, if someone in the middle tries to look at it, they'll disturb it. And if we're clever about how we do things, we can detect when someone has disturbed our quantum state. So this is, yeah, this is quantum photography. It's a new hardware based on the rules of quantum mechanics. And that allows you to exchange keys perfectly secure. On the other hand, there's something called post-quantum cryptography. So one thing you might have heard as a scare tactic in a lot of news about quantum computing is that, you know, uh, because quantum computers are able to factor numbers much faster, if a quantum computer with, you know, a certain number of qubits comes out tomorrow, then every bit of security in the world is going to crumble right away. Sounds terrifying, right? No one expects, and that's the kind of thing that's going to happen tomorrow, absolutely no one. The pessimists say it will never happen, the optimists say it's 50 years away for that level of data. Uh, but, you know, it's important to think about these things now. So what those quantum we're talking to do is, uh, instead of thinking that everyone's going to have access to quantum cryptography, think about different ways to encrypt information that are not going to be able to be broken by quantum mechanics. So in this particular example, uh, RSA uses factoring as its routine. So if I have a good factoring, something that can factor numbers very well, I can break it. Maybe there's other problems that would not be able to be broken by something that a quantum computer is good at. Yeah. So you find problems that are hard for both classical and quantum computers, and you base your recovery protocols on those. Uh, but yeah, then getting more to like just you know the fundamental physics, we're not thinking as much about quantum information. We start thinking about things like quantum sensors. So when we have these qubits, uh, if we say make them out of these superconducting circuits, what we're basically doing is we have some device in there, and it has some current flowing through it, and we're putting it in a very very static magnetic environment such that. Uh, we have a very well-defined energy splitting between those two states. The annoying part here is that it's incredibly sensitive to magnetic field fluctuations. This is, if you want a nice coherent qubit, this is annoying. Magnetic fields, you know, you shield for them, but stray magnetic fields do occur. The nice thing is, okay, what if I don't care about it as a qubit anymore, and I care about it as a magnetic field sensor? Now all of a sudden, this sensitivity is a huge plus. So these things that, you know, once we're able to isolate these quantum systems, they might no longer be, you know, they might still not be good qubits, they might still have a lot of work left to make them into good qubits, but they might be fantastic at sensing the things, the exact things that mess them up. But then beyond that, we can also start thinking about uh, what entanglement can do as a sensor. So this plot here, for example, is from the uh, LIGO team, the gravitational wave, uh, the gravitational wave detector. And, and one of their problems they have is, yeah, they have basically what they do to measure gravitational waves is they have this big optical interferometer. They send a laser beam across two different paths, make it travel for a few kilometers, recombine it, and measure how it interferes with itself. Neat thing is that if you inject some, some a little bit of entanglement into that system, so something called squeezing, 
you can reduce the noise in that inner throng. So this is using the entanglement. Effectively, now you have this uh, correlation between two different spots, and or correlation, uh, effectively in this case, a correlation in photon number, and that reduces the noise in the system, and you can get better measurement results through, the, through having these quantum states of light. Or I can think about entanglement between multiple particles. This is something that comes up in nuclear magnetic resonance. So if I have a nuclear, a nuclear, an NMR system, and I have entanglement between the different atoms that I'm imaging, yeah, sorry, entanglement between the different atoms and molecules that I'm imaging, I can think about applying lessons that I've learned from quantum error correction to get better resolution. So quantum error correction would be if I have, think about my qubit, and I think about encoding it in many qubits so that I'm able to recognize when an error occurs, I can apply those same kind of tools to, uh, to resolution correct images uh, in other systems. So you know, take the lessons that I've learned from thinking about qubits, take the lessons that I've learned from thinking about quantum information, and apply them to other systems. <laughs> and finally, there's also stuff like quantum materials, which, you know, quantum sensing is new techniques. These are new structures. So quantum materials, it's, you know, somewhat just the relabeling of condensed matter physics. But what we're talking about there is materials where the quantum properties matter. Things like you know, electron tunneling matter. Things like topology matter. Uh, which is not necessarily you know, true, I think, but just a block of a substance. And then, of course, there's good old fundamental science. So that's just thinking about things that you don't think about having an application right away. So say I want to care deeply about uh, entanglement structure. So if I have five particles, I have five qubits, how many ways can I think about entangling them? Because you know, I can think about entangling qubit A and qubit B, or qubit C and qubit D, or I can think about entangling all four together in such a way that they all, you know, I can't think about, I have to think about them all as one system. These are somewhat complicated questions that do not have easy answers and do not have easy applications. But you find ways to apply them down the line. There's between places like any university, especially in places like the Perimeter Institute, there's a lot of room for exploration here and a vast need to keep fundamental science alive. So you never know what you're going to find. And in worst case scenario, you just figure out new stuff about the universe, and that's pretty complicated. All right, so yeah, that was, that's number one, is that if you have a university system, you can diversify like this. The second you know, kind of obvious use of a university of that system is education. And that's kind of more, mostly what I do, is to, uh, think about how we're going to educate people about quantum physics and about quantum information science. So to talk about education, I think about four specific audiences. So the general public, high school science, undergraduate students, and graduate students. And there's a different kind of thing that we want to impart for all of these different groups. So, you know, for general public, we're not trying to get the general public to, you know, deeply understand the mathematics of quantum information. We're trying to get awareness. You know, this is what quantum is. This is, you know, notably, this is what quantum isn't. And you know, build on that and you know, make it part of the general, uh, the general vocabulary. With high school students, we want to generate interest. With undergraduate students, we want to generate knowledge, and with graduate students, we want to generate proficiency. And what we really think, especially with these, these last three groups, is that we're generating kind of the future quantum workforce. So these will be the people that will grow up and be the ones who actually make this technology happen, be the ones that actually work with this technology when it does come to full fruition. So yeah, how do you get across, especially to the general public in high school, excuse me, Graduate students, they get to that point, they know something. Undergraduate students, they're going into it, they have some interest. But to get to the general public and high school students, generally you have to assume that they don't have any prior information. So, step number one, you always break it down to the essentials. As a step number two, we just break away from historical treatments. So a lot of times when people talk about quantum physics, it kind of starts with, well, in 1906, Planck did this. If you're in science, you should know who Planck is. And you should know the story of what Planck did. Is that necessarily what you want to say as the first thing when talking about quantum physics to someone who doesn't know anything about quantum physics? Maybe what's maybe what's you know, better talk about, okay, there are two rules of quantum physics. Things can exist in superposition states, and when you measure it, you break that superposition, collapse that wave function. Start talking about things like that instead as kind of the starting point. Uh, you find hands-on demonstrations, even if they're just analogies. So one, one good example of this is the polarization of light. 
So when we talk about superposition, we mean something that can be in two states at the same time. Uh, if I'm just worried about one single qubit, I can emulate all of that physics using the laser. So anything that one qubit can do, I can do with a laser beam, and it show, but yeah, which is not doing anything quantum necessarily, but is showing the requisite physics. That's giving people the chance to get a hands-on experience with that physics. And then most importantly, is to be wary of misinformation. Especially, so my personal pet peeve one is always entanglement uh, can be used to communicate faster than the speed of light. Uh, well, it comes up a lot, and being wary of like, you know, okay, these things are false, but like in the media, uh, how do we get around that? How do we uh, explain that then? <laughs> but yeah, it shouldn't be that difficult, like, sorry, it shouldn't be that difficult to get people interested in quantum mechanics, because there's a lot of cool stuff here. On the one side, it's just conceptually pretty exciting. When you start thinking about quantum mechanics, you have to start asking questions like, what does it mean to make an observation? So, like I said, when you have two objects, they can be in superposition, but when I measure them, that collapses the wave function. What does that imply about what an observer is? What does that imply about what a measurement is? The question gets weird really fast. Um, then you have to start adding in flavors like entanglement, two particles that are completely separate from each other, but you can't describe one without describing the other. But, like I said, you can't use that, you can't use that to communicate in any way. It's a very subtle phenomenon. Where exactly does that line get drawn? Tricky, interesting questions that are really fun to talk about. And now on the other side, it does have actual power applications. So we've talked a bit about things like you know, sensors and communication and computing. But I'm also talking about things that we've had in our pocket for years. So oftentimes we call this kind of future technology, this information-based technology, the second quantum revolution. The first quantum revolution happened in the 1950s. It's a long time. We're still working on you know, figuring out some kinks there. But at the end of the day, things like lasers, we couldn't even imagine having without knowing already about quantum physics. It's a quantum phenomenon that we're able to use uh, to get something that's useful. Things like nuclear magnetic resonance. We're you know, talking about imaging the spins, imaging through the spins of individual atoms inside molecules. It's something you can't even think about if you don't take quantum physics for granted. Things like semiconductor chips or uh, light emitting diodes. It's all only possible to model if you have an understanding or at least are willing to accept quantum mechanics. So, uh, it's not just future things that are powered by quantum, things that we've been using for 50 odd years uh, meet the exact same things. We're just looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, yeah, so at the IPC, we do try to get out to people in these kind of age groups. So for the high school students in particular, uh, we have a quantum coffee school for young students. And if there's any kids, nieces, nephews that are, you know, in grade 10, 11, or 12, I highly recommend uh, sending them our way. It's an eight-day workshop. Uh, and we just hang out, talk about entanglement, talk about quantum physics for eight days, uh, get them in the lab, hands-on with some stuff. And they seem to have fun. Uh, and then uh, we also have our Schrodinger's class program where we go after the teachers instead. So that's a three-day professional development workshops for high school physics and math teachers, kind of teaching the basics of quantum physics, and, you know, trying to plan out a week-long unit on quantum physics, but from a more information theory perspective. And then do we have undergraduate students here by any chance? Yeah. Okay, then I highly recommend looking at the Undergraduate School for Quantum Information Processing. That's a two week long summer school. Uh, summer. And yeah, so it's two weeks of classes as well as lab demonstrations. And then we have, uh, it's often followed by a, month, a four month long summer research term, effectively a co op term. Uh, and we also offer, as well, courses mostly at the graduate level, but there are, of course, undergraduate quantum, general quantum courses at the university as well. Uh, as well as you know, various quantum information specialized degrees. So that's effectively what I had to say today. Uh, we do have, uh, so on Wednesday, February 13th at the Apollo, we have a quantum shorts screen. So this is a program run by the Center for Quantum Technology, uh, sorry, the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore. Uh, yeah, and we're uh, the local partner with them for that, so we'll be showing some of the finalists there to vote on who made the best short quantum film of the year. Uh, and I encourage you to download our fun little Angry Birds ripoff for the birds uh, quantum features instead. 
and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, on what uh, computers the students run their quantum algorithms? On what computers do the students run their quantum algorithms? Um, so for the most part, they're laptops. Uh, yeah, the laptops are not quantum computers, but what we'll do effectively is we'll have something in there that's simulating the quantum physics. And you can do that for a few qubits, no problem. So you're just basically crunching out the math. Uh, once you get to, uh, I think the number is you know, something like 20 qubits, your laptop is definitely going to crash. When you get to something like 50 qubits, supercomputers crash. Uh, yeah, but however, there are uh, different ways to go around that. So uh, IBM, for example, has a five qubit quantum computer that's open for use. It's called the IBM Quantum Experience, and you can design your own circuit using their language and run it on their quantum computer. It's noisy, it's not a perfect quantum computer, but for five qubits, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah. How about researchers? I know that uh, you have a team that's working on quantum programming languages. Yeah. So how they uh, they do just theoretically, or they do also practically experimenting? Yeah. So a lot. So a lot of it is theoretical in terms of you know, thinking about what algorithms will actually get a speed up. What algorithms is a quantum computer useful for? But in terms of quantum programming languages, a lot of that is being built for computers that don't yet exist. So it's designing the programming language ahead of it. You can think about that as if I was designing Python in 1971. You know, so well before I would ever have a computer that could run Python, but I'm still going to make sure that that's ready. So when the computer exists, it's there. Um, yeah, so you know, for example, just uh, I don't mean to be an advertisement for IBM, but I'll pick on them since I started. Uh, their programming language is designed that it's functioning with their small term quantum computer, which does not have what we call the quantum advantage. You can't do anything that a simulator couldn't also do. But they have the language designed in such a way that when, if they do have a useful quantum computer, that language will be able to be used directly. And there are other companies working on designing their own languages as well. You mentioned a few names of these languages, like IBM one. IBM's one is Kiskit. Uh, I know that Xanadu in Toronto has one called Strawberry Fields. Uh, I'm blanking on others, but does that Microsoft one, I'm blanking on the name. Q++. 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 Q++
but something where it becomes useful in the same way that supercomputers are useful for doing quantum chemistry problems as a first step. That's in the near, that's in the relatively near future. Uh, depending on, you know, there could be a miracle, there could be a miracle that makes it happen really fast. There could be a roadblock that makes it happen, you know, not for a couple of decades, but in that range. The Cubits, yeah. So, out of all those, now since you're the spread of the right? Do you know any real effort that make the quantum theory of photons? And I'm going to do a lot of people like involved in the superconducting and the negative photons. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, the question was can you, uh, is anyone making a strong effort towards photonic? So the reason that people don't generally, or that people in, until a couple of years ago had basically completely written it off, uh, was because it's the gates for the two photons talking. Things like that controlled not gate are really hard to do. Photons are great in the sense that they don't decohere the same way that ions and superconducting circuits do, because uh, you know they're very well isolated from the environment. It's, it's light it just flies through space. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if I have light and I want to get to talk to other light, it's a really hard problem to happen, and it's something that uh, when it does happen, happens what we call probabilistic. So I can do a C0 that works 100% of the time, 12% of the time. That's that's kind of the level where we're at. Uh, but there are a couple companies seriously pursuing it, and the way they do that is they don't think about things in the qubit language. So they do something called continuous variable quantum computing, and uh, you can think about that uh, similar to thinking about the difference between digital zero or one computing and analog computing. Or instead of thinking about zeros and ones, I'm thinking about some continuous spread. If I have light that, if I think about light you know, as a photon number distribution that has a continuous spread, I can do uh, continuous variable sorts of algorithms using light. And with that, you no longer need uh, them to talk to each other as long as you generate them, sorry, there's a detail, as long as you generate them originally in a very, very entangled state. So it's a combination of continuous variable quantum computing and what's called the cluster state quantum computing that give photons a chance. No one's saying it's the front runner, but there are a couple companies, including uh, one big one, big one that started in Toronto called Xanadu, uh, that are seriously pursuing that. The issue is that you to talk Um, yes, yeah, so getting them to talk to each other, kind of like, so getting them to stay in one place for a while is a problem. Uh, it's less of a problem for getting them to talk to each other. Getting them to talk to each other is, yeah, it's just something that's difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah, getting them to time up with each other can be a problem if we want to get this to many, many systems. I can think about this kind of probabilistic gate that I was talking about that only works, you know, 12% of the time. But I can think about just repeating that gate many, many times if I could hold on to the other photons while I kept retrying this gate. So that is where that does come in, where I can't hold on to the other photons in the circuit while I'm trying this gate multiple times. So that become, that is a huge problem. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the two quantum things and exploit the light on the polarity. Oh, so with light, there's things you can exploit really well. Sorry, it's four different things you can exploit. Well, I guess the better question is, what are the current technologies? What So the thing that, I'll back up one second here, come, come to that at a slightly different angle. So the question was, uh, you can think about encoding photons in, as different superpositions, which one is actually useful? So let's talk about a context where photons themselves are actually useful, and that's quantum communication. So quantum communication, or sending quantum signals from one place to another. It'd be ridiculous to think about doing that with ions or with superconducting circuits. You can't put those in a truck and move them across. So when you think about quantum communication, you think about photons just by default. Uh, but now what I need is something that I can encode my photon in a superposition of. So if I'm going through space, what I generally want to do is encode it in a superposition of polarization. So photon with an electric field going horizontal, or a photon with an electric field vertical. But if I'm going through optical fiber, then my problem is that if uh, my optical fiber twists, that rotates my polarization. So it's 
somewhat difficult to keep polarization stable, stable enough to apply for, especially over a long distance. So what they usually do there is they do, instead of superposition of polarizations, a superposition of times. So I think about my photon as a pulse. So instead of it being like you know a continuous wave, I think about it as you know, a little pulse trial, like a photon of football. And I'm going to say that it's a superposition of being a little bit early, depending on some clock, or a little bit late relative to some clock. And that's how a lot of the like, commercial quantum key distribution systems that exist, or, dare I say all the commercial quantum key distribution systems that exist, operate using that math principle. So there's a clock. Yeah. You're, you're shipping time. Your time is for the location. You're getting yeah, time. You can think, because photons always travel at the speed of light, uh, a shift, or if it's traveling this way, a shift in time is equivalent to a shift in this direction. But it's not like these and these, so it's like no side of the Yeah, no, you would think about it as being a shift in, uh, along the direction that it's traveling. Yeah. You can also think about things like superpositions of different colors, like 633 nanometers versus 633.1 nanometers, and that's also a valid thing that you can put in superposition as well. So yeah, the first question is, is it effectively, is it an engineering problem? The second part is it at a point where you, know, you don't need to have a PhD to get into it. And there are people that Yeah. Um, I would say it's not at the point where it's only an engineering problem, for sure. It's at a point where there are certain architectures that have massive engineering problems that you don't need to, uh, are not necessarily quantum only. So there are definitely contributions to the field that can be made or need to be made by people who are not quantum trained. And this does not exist in a problem. A lot of this is you know, cryogenics. You don't need to know quantum physics to know cryogenics. And if you know a lot about quantum physics, odds are you don't know, like, you're not the world's leading expert in specifically cryogenics, uh, project engineer. So yeah, there are, uh, but at the same time, it is still at the point where people with that quantum expertise are really needed, uh, not only to actually build the systems, not just in that regard, but in terms of like designing those systems, and once you have those systems, actually making them do something, actually making sure that they're doing something as they were intended to. It's, but it's not a problem that can be solved by only people specifically <laughs> quantum information training. But then on the other side, yes, there is also definitely room for people with business backgrounds especially people with business backgrounds willing to you know, learn some of the material. Um, and I think that overlap between science and business, they're seeing, seeing a large room of quantum startups, and people with business backgrounds are essential to get them developed. Is there an opportunity to get involved in the IPC in any way right now if you're not a researcher? Um, in, ter in terms of business, I'd say yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. I would draw a line between IQC and quantum value investments. No, there. They have things for sure. There are two separate things. So quantum value investments. Yeah. There, there's people are needed there, and a lot of the businesses that do go out uh, and that do get funded. Not all, but a lot that do get funded through there uh, have their roots at the IQC. Uh, but that would be their domain. Yeah. It's a good idea to uh, like the concept of the story a little. Like, 
what a pro yeah, like not so yeah. So uh, I mean my question is like so from like my own personal experience I find it quite interesting to like think about like what those scientists were thinking and, yeah. and like their their debates between like between like, <coughs> war, for example. Yeah. So like I because it because it kind of humanizes the concept and makes it makes it more engaging. Yeah. Like, Yeah, that's a good point. So, like, yeah, how do you separate it from the history while still keeping a human element to it? Right. Um, that's a good question. It's tough. Uh, so, like, the reason to separate it from the history, I think, would be if you focus on the history as the starting point. Like, I think the history is important and it needs to be included. But is that the way in? Because then you kind of get bogged down in things like the photoelectric effect and things like Compton scattering, which are important effects but are not necessarily the most relevant things to current quantum tech. Um, and yeah, I mean, like it's a lot of fun to talk about how exactly Planck came up with the concept of a photon. It's a really good story. I'm not saying you throw that in the bin. That's great. Uh, but yeah, that is that is a good point. How do we humanize more abstract things? How do we humanize superposition? A lot of time that ends up going to cartoons. That ends up going to things like Schrodinger's cat, uh, which is one way to you know, give it a face effectively, as opposed to thinking about here's the solar transfer. Yeah, so that's one, but it is true. Yeah. And, and the other thing is with using analogies like yes. this cat is it's there are I mean they're inherently flawed, like yeah. they like you can't because there there can be no classical analogy to a quantum concept. So yeah. it, I think while analogies are useful to some extent, like it's important to draw that that line. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That, yeah, analogies are useful to point, which is one of the reasons why I do love light, because there is a clear analogy that uh, when it's talking about superposition and measurement that <coughs> does work on the miniature scale. It says if you do something with lasers, you look at what happens. You say, okay, now imagine you only had one photon. Everything works the exact same, but you know it's the same principle, the same math behind all of it. But you're right. Things like Schrodinger's cat. Like if I want to start thinking about you know, a cat and dangling an object, it, it breaks down. Uh, and you know, if I want to try to visualize a superposition on something like a ball or a cat, it's not something I can imagine in my head. And yeah, that, so you do have to be careful with those for sure. John, yep. I was told uh, by the head of IBM's uh, art program, yep. Bob Sewer, he says that they are looking for a Canadian partner mm -hmm. at the university to have these homes around the world uh, on them. Yeah. For a Canadian partner university that backed us a hub and a corporation and it's partnering with the third part of research. So I have two partners. Have they reached out to IQC or the university wanted to say, hey, it's a logical um, to partner with you guys, or have they decided to go or reached out elsewhere in Montreal? I think I have to say no comment to that first one. Um, <laughs> Read it, what you may. Um, uh, but I don't know of any final decision. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, uh, they did reach out to us, and they are looking for, of course, startups who can take advantage of their software programs. So if there is anybody who you know, I can put you in touch with them. They are very happy to put you guys under the umbrella of IBM Cube. So they do have programs where they don't have a seed funding or anything. This is stage, but they can help you in any other way besides funding. Yeah. I, I just wonder if there's a tension here between uh, quantum value investments and Mike Lab's previous investment of $390 million in his personal fortune in yeah. uh, this technology in this region. And then we have another big player coming from both sides. And if, that's, if there's going to be competition in there, and if that competition is ultimately going to hurt the advancement of quantum science in this region. I think if it becomes competition, then yeah, it can. Or competition can be good. Competition can help things grow. Uh, so, like, yeah, when I, when I think about like the big companies getting involved, uh, it's natural to worry about that. Thankfully, a lot of what I've seen from the big companies is they are hiring people from universities who have a more academic mindset. You know, of course, you know, they, they report to people with more 
business mindset, but because it's driven by academics, it still uh, it's not fully closed in. It's very, it's still a fairly collaborative environment that I've seen and that I've heard from uh, most people in those kind of environments. Um, so is there? Yeah. So that in that sense, I'm not as worried as I maybe could be. Uh, yeah. And IBM has been like. Once again, I don't want to be an IBM head. <laughs> uh, but IBM also, like, yeah, where they've been reaching out to startups. We have uh, partnered with them on some things with our summer schools in terms of using their quantum computer, uh, their IBM quantum experience for some programming. So they are open and receptive to uh, universities and I guess startups. 